them, how to properly how to properly store them, and then how to scatter them outside or sow them. Um, and with that, I am with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. I am the Community Engagement Specialist. We are a nonprofit land trust that's located just outside of Chicago. We're like an hour or so northwest of Chicago. Um, and what we like to do is preserve and take care of land and uh, just work with landowners who want to do the same thing. And we do that in a whole variety of ways through programs and easements, um, the conservation at home program, volunteer programs, all kinds of different things. Um, so check out our website, follow us on social media. If you are not in McHenry County, um, I suggest you reach out and find your local land trust. There are local land trusts all across the country. You can just go to findalandtrust.org and type in your zip code and see who's nearby and reach out. Get on their e-newsletter list, become a member. That's how we do the work we do is through member support. Um, and just find out how they can support you and you can support them. All right. So let's start with why are we even talking about this? Why are we collecting native plant seed? So native plants are plants that have grown in a certain region for thousands of years um, with no human intervention. They have developed relationships with each other uh, through their root systems, through fungal connections, through bacteria, through wildlife, all kinds of different ways. And um, they're really important to the health of our pollinator community, to the health of our soil, to holding soil in place and not allowing it to erode away. They're really important to all different kinds of wildlife and in extension to us. And plus they're just really beautiful <laughs> as well. So um, when you have native plants in your yard, we're gonna go through some ways to just collect the seeds from those native plants that maybe you have in your yard. And it's really easy and simple to do. Whether you've got just like four little native plants or maybe you've got extensive acreage with tons of plantings, um, there's a lot you can do. It's super cheap. You spend like $3 on one plant and it could potentially give you hundreds of seed. And that's hundreds of new plants. Um, it's really effective as long as you're patient. <laughs> so scattering seed will uh, eventually end up in you getting some new plants, which is pretty cool. It can take a while though for some of those plants to show up, potentially a few years or even more. Um, it's really educational when you start kind of physically interacting with the plants in your yard and start ripping the seed heads apart, start learning about the physical structures of each uh, different kind of species and you really start to learn about them. It's pretty cool. This picture is, this is my daughter. She's um, standing on our front sidewalk collecting, I think it's prairie drop seed, seed heads and just dumping them in a little paper bag. Took her like three minutes or something to just kind of walk up and down the sidewalk and do that. And doing that, it's very therapeutic as well. It's just kind of mindless and meditative to kind of be outside in the fresh air, be doing something with your hands and um, just listening to birds and stuff. It's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, we're gonna talk here about the ethics of collecting seed. And it's important that you uh, basically don't wipe out the entire population. Okay, so we recommend that you collect, if you've got a bunch of perennials, which are plants that come back every year from the same root system, that you collect approximately, say, 30% of those seed and leave, you know, a bunch left. So 70%, leave them for wildlife, leave them to be able to drop naturally under the ground and grow. Annuals or biennials or rare plants only collect 10% of them. Now, this is just a recommendation. If it is your property, obviously you can collect as much or as little as you want. Now, collecting on other people's properties, you have to have permission from the landowner. So if it's public land, um, you cannot collect, whether it's, you know, the roadside or 
um, a conservation district site or a state park site, you have to have permission from that landowner in order to be able to collect those seeds. Um, and it's good to leave plenty of seed for wildlife. So in this picture here, this is my, my little niece, um, Isabel. We were at my mom's house and we were collecting seed from bloodroot, which is that crazy leaf plant there. It gets a real pretty white flower on it. And um, we accidentally went to town and collected basically all of the bloodroot seed. <laughs> So when we realized that, we just put a bunch of the seed back so that we were ethical seed collectors. And you can see the little seed in the white envelope down there in the left-hand corner. We're going to talk more about bloodroot, too, at the end. What do you need to collect seed? Um, really, just like some paper bags. I mean, that's all you really have to have. You can wear some gloves, too. I like wearing really thin gloves to be able to feel things through the gloves. Sometimes I don't even wear gloves. Depends on what I'm collecting. Things that you are optional, that you can use. You can use some scissors. Sometimes that's pretty helpful. Um, there's some heavier duty scissors if you don't wanna just like use the random scissors that are in your office. There's heavy duty ones from Fiskar that are pretty nice. There's a little seed harvesting hook that you can use. You don't have to have one of those, but you know what? I end up using that thing for all different kinds of activities, not just seed collecting. Um, you can use a little seed apron, which is that white bag thing. And it basically has a belt that collects around or goes around your waist. So then your hands are free. You don't have to have one of those though. Honestly, like those paper grocery bags, you can just use one of those and like, the ones that have handles are great because then you can just stick your hand through that and it's awesome. The, I like to use like a variety of sizes of paper bags too, sometimes the lunch sized ones, whatever. And then the rolling pin and the pliers, that's for later on when you're processing seed. Processing just means like ripping apart all the excess plant material from the seed itself. And so there's a variety of tools that are useful for that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna go through, we're gonna kind of like go through the major groups because all the different native plants that we have around here, they form different kinds of seeds that once you learn, um, once you learn kind of their like dispersal method, you get clues as to how to collect them. Um, so we're gonna start with the milkweed group. And these are ready when the seed pods first start to kind of split open a little bit, all right? Um, and you can see in the upper left there, there's a red no and a yellow yes. <laughs> the red no, that seed pod is still really green. The seeds inside it, when you split it open, those seeds are really light brown. You can see they're like super light kind of tan, as opposed to the one that says yes, that one is split open. Those seeds, for one thing, the pot itself is starting to slightly turn brown. Um, the seeds themselves are really dark chestnut brown. So you could see the difference between those two. That one is ready to be collected. That just means that the plant is, um, has put all of the energy into the seed development that it needs to in order for that seed to be able to successfully become a plant once it leaves its mother plant, okay? Um, so you're gonna hear me say that a lot tonight. Like when the seed is ripe, that just means it's ready, okay, to grow and become a new plant. Um, it's nice with these milkweeds if you collect them before they start exploding their fluff all over the place, because then it's just kind of a mess. So it's nice to collect these pods as a whole when they're light brown and just have a slight little split in them, because then you could take that entire pod and just stick it in a paper bag, okay? Um, some people go a step further and you can see on the bottom left there where they, uh, they'll actually rubber band each individual pod 
um, to kind of preemptively keep it from splitting open and like spewing its seeds all over the place. That's pretty labor intensive. You don't have to do anything like that, but you can. Um, one tip, so if you collect these pods at the correct time, you can kind of use your thumb and like go up through the pod and dislodge all the seeds in the fluff at one time in like a neat little bundle and then put just the seeds in the fluff into a paper bag. Put a couple quarters or coins in there and make a little slit in the bottom corner of that paper bag and shake it around, like close it, seal it, and then shake it around. And just those little brown seeds are gonna fall out through that bottom slit that you made in the corner. So it's kind of a fun little trick to do. Oh, and the picture on the right, the circle, that's just like, hey, this butterfly milkweed pot is ready to be collected. Like it's not spewing the seeds all over the place as opposed to the one just next to it, which has already started. That's hard to collect those when they're fluffing all over the place. Okay, bottle brush grass. So this group, um, this is a group of seeds that shatter. So bottle brush grass is this really pretty grass that grows in like the oak woods, basically. Um, and the seed head structure looks like something that would be used to clean a bottle. So it's called bottle brush grass. And it's really cool. So all the shattering seeds, all that means is they are ripe or ready to be collected if you touch it and they easily dislodge, they easily fall off, okay? And so here's a little video that shows you how easy this is to collect. And this is a, this is, these are seeds that if I was gonna be collecting a ton of them, I would put gloves on normally because this is a little bit sharp. All right, let me play this little video. So I start at the bottom and I work my way up and just easily dislodge the seed. Okay, they super easily come off as I work my way up. The seed itself, if you look in the picture on the right, I have the seed circled in yellow. Um, it's not those crazy long spiky things. Those are called awns, all grasses. Have awns that are attached to the seed itself. So the seed is inside the little awn. You don't have to worry about like removing the awns or anything like that. You would literally, I would take that bundle that's in my hand, put it in a paper bag. And we're gonna go through what, what does she do with her paper bag seeds? <laughs> we're gonna go through that, okay? Um, another shattering plant are hazelnuts. So I don't want you guys to forget about your shrubs uh, as well. They're producing seeds right now too. And hazelnuts are a fantastic landscaping shrub. I absolutely love them. Um, rip out your burning bushes, put in hazelnuts. <laughs> anyway, these are some other ones that when they're ready, so when they're ripe, um, if you just kind of shake the, the shrub stem a little bit, they fall off. And they're ready when they're that dark brown color, real kind of chestnutty color. Um, they are not ripe when they look like on the left there. They're really green. I could tell you though that squirrels just take them even when they're green and they eat them <laughs> anyway. So sometimes people will harvest them early and then like in August or something and just spread them out on a tarp that apparently they like hide from squirrels. I don't know, but in an open air, sunny area on a tarp and they'll ripen them that way, safely contained from squirrels. Okay, so um, moving on from shattering plants to plants with droops. What is a droop? So everybody thinks of these as a berry. Technically they're called a droop, whatever. It's called a droop because um, there is only one seed inside the fleshy structure for each berry looking thing. So if you look in the bottom left there, um, you can see I wrote seed with little arrows. 
those are those seeds are inside each of those little droops there. And there's a ton of different kinds of plants that have these, and a lot of them you could see them right now in um, the early fall. You could see them out in the woods when you're walking around. You're like, whoa, it's that bright red stuff. This is an example from one of the Solomon seal type plants here. Um, and you can see on this little cluster of droops that are at the end of the plant, some of them are really dark red and then others are kind of mottled white-ish. And if you were able to squeeze those, the ones that are mottled white kind of pink, those would feel really hard. Those are not ready to be picked yet. The ones that are ready are the ones that are deep red. Um, and if you squeeze them, they would be a little bit mushy feeling. Now, we suggest not storing droops in a paper bag. We suggest that you direct sow them. That means you sow means like fling them where you want them to grow. <laughs> so some people are going to try to propagate these in like a little tray I'm not going to go through how to do that tonight. That's like a whole separate program. That's actually something that I'm not very experienced with. I tend to just throw these out in nature and let them grow where they want to grow. Um, so so just means fling them where you want them to grow. <laughs> okay. So we, we don't want them to mold, basically. That's why we don't want them to be stored for long periods of time. If they mold, chances are that seed's going to be no good. Um, if you want, you could store them in a plastic bag in the, in the fridge for a couple days and they won't mold. Like if you want to save some for a friend and then give them to them a few days later, that's fine to do that. Uh, we suggest that you wear some gloves when you're cleaning these. Some people get irritated from that, the fleshy juice, like the juice of the droop, whatever. Some people don't get irritated by it either. Another droop example are the jack in the pulpits. Um, so bright red, you can see that on the bottom, they're ready when they're bright red. You see those in the woods right now. Um, not ready when they're dark green, which you can see right above that. Um, again, these are clusters of droops. We suggest that you direct sow them. You can pick off each individual droop and kind of fling those around to different places. Or again, you can store them in a fridge. So think about it, think about this like you're, like there's no humans, right? To assist in the distribution of these plants. How are they growing? What are they doing? These seeds are used to going through an animal's digestive tract. So some kind of animal, a mammal usually is gonna walk past and they're gonna eat those delicious bright red droops. And that's going to go through the entire digestive system of that animal and be exposed to acid and all kinds of fluids and all kinds of stuff. And then it's gonna be excreted out. And that's what's setting that plant up for really good germination is when it does that. So if it's just kind of sitting and molding, it's not going to germinate correctly. Okay, so this next group is really cool, the coneflowers. Pretty much everybody is familiar with coneflowers. And it's literally just this whole group of plants that the central um, shape of the plant is a triangle or a cone shape. A lot of these are the echinaceas. And um, right now they're this kind of like dark spiky color. And it, people get confused about like, where is the actual seed on this? And so these are some that I suggest you just start, like clip one off, clip like right on the, right below the central cone there on the stem, clip one off with some scissors and, and like put it on a paper towel on your kitchen table and just start ripping it apart. Like I cut one in half with a steak knife. That's a picture in the white paper towel there. Cut straight through that cone and you're gonna really start to learn about the structure of it and you're gonna find the seed. So the seed I have circled in yellow, I think it looks like a little tooth or something. That is what is directly connected to the cone structure itself. All the little spiky parts on the edges those are not the co those are not, sorry, those are not the seeds, okay? So the seed is 
directly connected to the cone. And then you can start to like kind of separate those. It's pretty cool. Um, so when these seed heads are really darkly colored and really crumbly almost, that's when they're ready to be collected. Not when they're like full of beautiful, you know, petals and colors and pink and purple and green and whatever. That's not when they're ready to be collected. Those seeds are not ready yet. So I would just snip this entire thing and put it in a paper bag is all I would do when they're ready. Um, what do I say here? Wear gloves. Yep, these are pretty spiky. And then when you're ready to start, I'm going to go through processing, but when you're ready to start like over the winter processing these, which is, which is just removing those little seeds from the rest of that plant material, you can use pliers and just kind of rip them apart if you want to. Um, or you can just leave them all as like the cone. You can just leave it as one structure and throw that out where you want it to grow. The advantage of removing the chaff or the surrounding plant material from the seed is that you're going to speed up the germination process. Okay. And I mean, that's cool because seed, seed is slow anyway. <laughs> so if we can do something to speed it up and ensure success, then it's good to do that. All right, purple prairie clovers, the crumbly cone heads. This is my favorite group to collect. Um, all the crumbly cone heads, just because they are very soft <laughs> when you collect them. So uh, an example is purple prairie clover. So with the seed heads, and they're pretty, they're ready like right now, basically. When you put your hand at the bottom of the uh, seed head and you run your fingers up, when they're soft and fuzzy and they easily dislodge in your hand, it's ready to be collected. If you meet resistance when you pull up, it is not ready to be collected. The seeds are inside each of those tiny little gray compartments, okay? And all the little gray fuzz around it, it's called the hull. There's no need to like, try to remove the seed from the hull. Like with these, you don't have to do that at all. We just kind of fling them out um, where they're supposed to grow. Okay, so the next group are the beaks. And an example are penstemons or beard tongues. And if you look really closely at that picture where it's sitting in my hand and all the little seeds are crumbled in my hand, you can see that it actually looks like a little tiny beak open. And um, so the penstemons are an example of a beak group. These are really hard and they will like literally if you just press it with like your thumbnail, they're extremely difficult to open up. So you wait for them, you got two choices. You either wait for them to open up on their own then when they're brown like this and they're starting to be open, you clip them on the bottom and put the whole thing in a bag. Or if you don't want to wait that long, um, you can, when the beak is still closed, but they're brown, you can clip it and then put it in like a Ziploc or something. And I've taken uh, the flat part of a meat mallet and just gently kind of pounded on it. And that forces them open. And then you get the seeds, which are those tiny, tiny little crumbles um, to come out that way. Okay. So these have a really, like this really weird smell. I don't know why. There's all kinds of cool sensory things that happen when you're collecting seeds. All right. So the next group are the shakers. So these are ready to be collected when you literally tip it upside down, squeeze it and shake it and the seeds fall out. So an example is wild bergamot or monarda. And the seed heads, when they're ready, are gonna be just look brown and dry like this. I'm sure you're catching on when things are brown and dry looking. <laughs> Usually they're ready to be collected. The rule of thumb is like, usually about a month or so after the flower itself fades. That's usually when these seeds are going to generally be ready to be collected. So with Minarda, 
Um, there's all these little tubes. So I think they're called the calyx, all those little tubes. Um, when there's a seed inside each little tube, all right? And so what I would do is just like grab a bunch of these together, a bunch of stems, and take some scissors and clip it, and then just take all the seed heads and put them into a paper bag. And um, you can try to like squeeze them, get all the little individual seed seeds out. You can do that, or you could just throw the whole seed head out where you want it to grow. These smell really good. I cannot walk past these seed heads without squeezing them and smelling them. They smell like minty and just wonderful. Okay, Joe Pie. So Joe Pie, um, I don't know if these are quite ready yet. I don't think they are in my woods anyway. We might need a, they might need a few more weeks. Um, so Joe Pie is our, an example of seeds that are ready to be collected when they're fluffy. So it's a little bit similar to the milkweed, except it's not a pod. These are literally just like these open to the air, fluffy structures. <laughs> and the seed, as you can see in the picture on the left there, the seed is attached to the fluff. Um, and it's a very, very tiny seed. And so what I would do to collect the Joe Pie is, down at the bottom where all of those kind of stems come to a central point, I would just snip that whole thing when all these seeds are white and fluffy. And then I would take it and put it into a bigger paper bag, fluff down, okay? So like the fluff side would go down so that they're not just puffing and flying all over the place. There's a lot of plants that do this, asters, golden rods, um, all kinds of things do this. So this, that method of collection applies to all these. When they're white and fluffy like this, they're ready to be collected. All right, so hitchhiking seeds. These can be super annoying. <laughs> How do you know when they're ready to be collected? When they stick to you. So desmodium or tetrafoil is an example of that. Each little seed, if you look up in the upper left, each little seed is inside one of those little pods. Um, it's called a loment, each little pod. And uh, you don't have to dehull these or, or anything like that. You can literally just throw the whole pod structure out there. If you want these growing in your garden, a lot of times people don't like these sticky seeded plants growing in their gardens. I have some of these out in like bigger bigger restored areas, not necessarily my small gardens. Again, they're ready to collect when they start sticking to you. It's a pretty genius dispersal mechanism, if you ask me. <laughs> so they would stick to animals and stuff too. That's how they kind of spread themselves around. Ballistic seeds. All right, this is so cool. These are seeds that fling up to 30 feet when they are ripe. And we're gonna look at a video of jewel weed here. This is my daughter's little hand. Um, okay, so we're gonna watch this video. So when they're ripe, they fling. It's so cool. So she touches it and boom, you see that white flinging structure. I don't know the correct botanical term. And, and all the little dark seeds that fling out. So there's a couple different kinds of plants. I'll play it again just because it's so cool. There's a couple different kinds of plants that do this. Um, Jewelweed is a wet growing plant that likes like disturbed culverts and creek areas. And um, there's wild geranium and violets do this, toothwort, prairie phlox. A lot of different plants have a ballistic method of seed dispersal. How do you collect these? <laughs> Not all of them are as easy as the jewelweed where we were able to just kind of walk right up to it and get it to fling right into our hands. Some of them are a lot more unpredictable, but basically if you pay attention to timing, you're like, all right, the flower petals have faded. I'm gonna wait about a month and then I'm gonna preemptively cut the whole seed structure off and put it into a mesh bag or something with very finely meshed um, and try to catch them before 
you know, or get the seed structure in the mesh and then let it explode inside the mesh. Some people will tie, there's these super cute tiny little mesh bags that they'll tie to the plant itself after the flower is faded to try to catch the seeds that way. These, we recommend direct sowing them or so you can keep them in a bag for a day or two and then we recommend just sewing them. Don't hold them in a paper bag for months, okay? So the droops and these ballistic seeds, we recommend just kind of direct sewing them right away. Okay, we're gonna play a game called Ready or Not. Basically, I'm just gonna show you two side-by-side -side pictures and I want you to decide which plant is ready to be collected and which one is not. You do not need to put the answer like in the chat, whatever, you don't have to do that. Just look at it and decide which one you think is ready. So here we go, picture one is on the left, picture two is on the right, we've got tall thimble weed. Which one do you think is ready? The one on the left, the one on the right. Look at the differences, look at the colors, look at what you think it probably feels like when you touch it. And yes, number two is ready to be collected. This is a crumbly cone head. This is one of those lovely ones where when you pull up on it, it feels like a delightful fuzzy sweater or something. <laughs> I love them. Um, funny thing, guys, these pictures are taken on the same day. And these plants are like three feet apart from each other. And that is super common. They're like, this individual plant is ready and this one's going to take a couple weeks. That happens. It's normal. Okay, so I would leave the one on the left and collect the one on the right. All right, which one's ready? Number one, number two. One on the left, number two on the right of this purple cone flower. Yes, number one is ready. So look at these colors. Look at one on the, sorry, the plant on the right, number two, is like greenish still. It's got some of the ray florets, petals, whatever, hanging off of it still. Um, lots of greens and yellows on that. Definitely not ready to be collected. Picture on the left, dry and brown and crumbly looking, isn't it? So I would just snip that whole thing. All right, ready or not with these golden Alexanders. These are shattering seeds, which means that they dislodge as soon as you touch, when you touch them, they fall off if they are ready to be collected. Um, Look at the color of these. Remember my dry brown crumbly looking clue? And yes, on the left, number one, that one is ready to be collected. Uh, number two on the right, you can see it's red, it's green, it's got a lot of vibrant color. And if you were able to actually feel it, you would feel that it's not dry feeling at all, as opposed to the one on the left. And when you touch those, those seeds, um, it just falls off right into your hand. Okay, final exam. No, it's not really a test. This is a video. Okay, so I'm gonna play this video and then I'm gonna play that video for the Prairie Doc. So that's what that seed head does when you kind of run your thumb over it. Do we think that one is ready or do we think this one is ready? That's what this seed head does from the Prairie Doc. This plant gets like eight feet tall. It's really cool. Out in prairies. Okay, yes, the first video. <laughs> Those seeds are ready to be collected. And the seed structure itself, um, I have them circled in yellow there down in the bottom. It's not those like long white things. It's just the little, it kind of looks like a sunflower seed to me. Um, those are the actual seeds. All right, so properly storing seed. Paper bags are your friends, not plastic. Things mold and get wet in plastic. Your whole goal is don't let your seeds mold. Keep everything open if you can for air circulation. Um, keep it away from rodents. So where do you store these seeds? I apparently store them on top of my washer and dryer on my kitchen counter next to the mescal, whatever, like find a place where there's no rodents. <laughs> so 
you can keep them in your garage if there's no mice. You can keep them in your basement if there's no mice. This is like a buffet for mice to get into. You don't want to do that, all right? Um, what I've started doing, so they're not just scattered all over my house, one of those big lawn waste bags, I will keep the individual little tiny lunch bags kind of like stacked inside there with everything open and kind of stacked so it's all getting air circulation. Then it's condensed in like a closet or something and not just all over my house. Um, you might get some insects coming out of some of the seeds. It's totally normal. If that bothers you, don't put them in a place where the bugs are going to cause an issue for you. How to process seeds. So remember what this means. This just means removing the excess chaff or plant material from around the individual seed structure itself. This does not have to be super precise, you guys. This does not have to be this like huge process. It can be as involved or not as involved as you want and have time for. So all the seed that you collected basically from July through, you know, October. Or so as long as it's not one of those ones I told you to direct sow. So the droops, we don't hang on to those. The ballistic seeds, we don't hang on to those. Everything else, You've got them in your little bags, right? So what do you do now? Well, over the winter, it's kind of cool, like when you're watching Netflix or something. I'll like set up a tarp in my living room and grab some of my kids and <laughs> we'll, I'll put out some buckets. So one bucket is to receive the seed themselves. The next bucket is for the chaff because I save that and I scatter that outside as well. Um, it's probably got seeds in it still. And it could have cool little insect parts like larva or pupa or cocoons or something inside of it. So I want to scatter that outside. I'm not just going to like throw it in the garbage can. Um, so here's a video, I think. All right. So this is my daughter. She's just literally just using her hands to kind of dry um dislodged the gentian, very fine, tiny gentian seeds. You can see how small they are into this bucket. If you want to be really careful about it, you can dislodge the tiniest seeds into a tiny, tiny container if you want to. If you want to keep these seeds separated by species, you can do that. Um, or you can combine them all by habitat, totally up to whatever you want to do. This is where you can get creative with stuff in your kitchen, whether it's like the rolling pin, pliers, scissors, stomping on some of the seed heads. There's all different things you can do to dislodge the seed from the seed structure itself. Um, if you run out of time, don't worry about it. Just like throw the entire seed structure out where you want it to grow. Who cares? So this, I do a lot of just kind of combining the seeds into like, I know I'm going to want it to go in this prairie area. So I'll do all those seeds together. Um, every once in a while, I'll keep certain species separated. If I want to create like a drift of a certain species, you know, like prairie drop seed or something, do whatever works for you. So then you've got all your seeds ready to go. Um, what do you do with them? So what I do with them is I sow, I like to sow them on top of the snow um, over the winter. And this makes sense. If you think about it, a lot of these native seeds need to experience a period of cold dormancy. That just means that they like hang out down in the soil and get frozen and thawed and all kinds of different things forces act on them, water and animals and all kinds of things. And over time, that works to break down the seed coat and allow for germination. Some seeds will sprout the next year. Um, some species like black-eyed Susan, that'll germinate that first year. Others take six years to germinate this way, like shooting star takes a long time, five or six years to germinate from seed. So I like to just kind of pile everything in a sled if it's snowed and then take it outside 
and grow it where I want it to grow. Um, it helps if you have kind of flagged off the area before it snows so you know where you're going to want to throw it because when snow is covering everything you just don't know. Um, and it's as easy as walking around and flinging it with your hands. You do not need any machinery for this at all. Um, I like to do this best over the winter. You can seed in the spring and summer and fall as well. You can do that, okay? But a lot of native seed needs to experience a cold dormancy. So um, do, it, do it over the winter. There's not like a ton of yard work to do anyway over the winter. And your whole goal is in these seeded areas, don't let weeds make seeds in them, okay? So that's a whole other program. But when you start to see a flower develop on a weed, you know that the next stage is going to be seeds that are being developed, right? So chop the flower head off on those seeds, mow them down, string trim them, pull them out, whatever you got to do. All right. So um, I want to cover some of the early spring wildflowers now because how people forget about these. And things like blood root, everybody pays attention to them when they have flowers and then they just ignore them. And I'm telling you right now, stop ignoring them. <laughs> Pay attention to the awesome seed structures. A lot of these early spring wildflowers um, have on their seeds this little white structure attached to it. You see it looks like a gummy worm or something. That's called an eliasome. And what that is, this is so fascinating. What that is, is it's like this fatty, whatever, protein structure that ants want to eat. So ants will take those seeds and they will go down into their tunnels under the ground. They'll eat the eliasome and they will discard the seed. They don't want the seed, they want the eliasome. And they discard the seed in like a waste chamber section of their tunnel um, that has like dead ant bodies and stuff in it. <laughs> and it's like the perfect, perfect fertilizer for these seeds to grow. It's awesome. So, and you can see what the pod looks like, the seed pod down in the lower left there. I have it circled in yellow. Um, about a month after the flower petals fall off, you're gonna start to pay attention to your seed pods. And when you split one real careful with a thumbnail and kind of peek inside, if those seeds are dark, dark brown chestnut color and you see that fleshy white eliasome, it's ready. Now, we suggest that you direct sow these early spring wildflowers. Don't hold on to these seeds in a bag, okay, for months. Don't do that. We suggest that you direct sow them so you can literally just like take some of the seeds out of the pod and fling them around if you want, or you can just lay the pod on the ground in a different area, or you can do nothing and let the ants spread them for you. Um, spring beauties, these are another one. Okay, these are so tiny. They are so, so, so small and delicate. Um, these usually bloom like, I don't know, middle of April, end of April, something like that. So then that means mid-May to end of May-ish is when they're gonna be ready to be collected right? About a month after the flower petals fade. Um, so the seed structures, you see that on the right there, they're a beak, right? So you can kind of see how it's like a beak. And when they're ready, those seeds are going to fall out and they have an eliasome attached to them as well. So they're like, hey, ants, come find me and move me, disperse me around so I can grow in other places. Again, direct sow them within a day or two or right away. Wild ginger, this one took me a little bit to figure out like, where's the actual seeds in this? This is weird. Wild ginger is one of my favorite ground covers for shady areas. Um, so it gets a weird red flower that just kind of like hangs on the ground like that. It like lays on the ground in May. 
Um, so then in June or so is when you can, the flower like loses its color and it kind of just looks weird and brown and mushy looking. So you can take that flower structure off, just kind of pop it off with a thumbnail and then like open up the back of it. Like start, you guys rip stuff apart. It's so fun to learn about it. And the seeds are, are in the back down and you can see that in the lower left there. Um, they're like down kind of near the stem almost. And those have an eliasome as well. And they're ready when they're dark brown chestnut color, okay? Sow them right away. Um, prairie smoke. Everybody who has a sunny yard with dry to medium soil should have some prairie smoke growing. This is a gorgeous, tiny little, beautiful landscaping plant that's actually pretty tough. Um, all right, so blooms in like May, and this is one that shatters. So that means when you touch it and the seeds are ripe, it easily just kind of falls out of the plant. Um, so it gets those beautiful pink blossoms in May, and then about a month later in like June at some point, all these white wisps or the smoke, part of the name is going to develop. And when you very gently tug on one of those wisps, when the seed super easily dislodges, you know it's ready to be collected, okay? And they'll look brown. Like you'll, when you look at the center of it, if it's green still, you're like, oh, you're not ready yet. So they'll look kind of brownish when you tug on those little wisps. These are a direct sow as well. Um, in mid-June and you can collect a bunch of it you know and just like have it in a bowl on your patio I don't know why I did that but uh, <laughs> direct sow these okay that's the best thing to do you're going to get the most germination I think um, if you direct sow them as opposed to if you hung on to these you're going to get minimal if any germination at all all right so um, here in McHenry County, we do uh, a seed share. We host a seed sharing event um, through the Land Conservancy and through some of our wonderful conservation easement owners who open their property up to allow people to come in and collect native seed. It's really cool. So this is an event that we do for our Land Conservancy members. Um, and this year it's in October. So if you're interested in attending and getting some free seed and you can bring seed to share if you have seed to share. Um, go to our website and register. It's pretty cool. Um, this We end up with a bunch of seed that we're able to use for our, our restoration projects on our sites and then landowners walk away with a bunch of different seed too. Um, and we also have a potluck and like a garage full of pre-collected seed that people bring and it's all labeled by species. So if you bring some seed, I don't care if it's just like a tiny little baggie of seed, that's awesome. Um, just label it with the species name and then that's gonna go into the collection of things to be shared. So it's really cool because we're all, it's a very kind of community grassroots feel. Um, and then we all kind of hang out and. Like we have an informal discussion about what's going on in our properties and I'm seeing this. What are you seeing? How do you address this problem? You know, it's a bunch of plant people together. So it's a great way to learn. And out in the field where we send you to actually collect stuff. I'm sorry if my dog starts barking. The doorbell just rang. I don't think he's going to bark. Um, we have guides out there that help you actually collect and learn how to collect the seed and teach you and stuff too. Okay, so here are some resources um, on why, where to buy seed, books on learning how to landscape and do restoration with native plant seed. I really like that Garden Revolution book. That's a great one. Um, and then some online resources. And I wanna call one of those out and that is the Field Museum Guide Two seed heads of common native plants of the tall grass region. That's like the super long name. That is an invaluable resource. Um, 
Okay, so that was put together by the Lake County Forest Preserve Di District and uh, some stewards through the Volunteer Stewardship Network. It is incredibly user friendly. So it groups all these seeds into shattering, crumbly cone head. It groups them by season that they're going to be ready to collect. It groups them by habitat. Like, it is so, and it's free. Like you can download all these guides for all these habitats online from the Field Museum's website. And it's all specific to Northern Illinois. I mean, it's applicable to much of the Midwest, but it is a, just an invaluable resource. So I suggest you check that out. Um, also the Land Conservancy, we run a Facebook group called LEARN, which stands for Landowner Ecology and Restoration Network. We encourage anybody to just post your questions about native plants on there, whether it's from your garden, whether it's from a larger restoration, and a bunch of like restoration ecologists and knowledgeable landowners will assist you and um, answer your questions. So post pictures and questions. We love to help people with all that kind of stuff. And with that, um, let's see here, Katie, what kind of questions do we have? So we haven't gotten any yet in the Q and A. Okay. I think people have just been like super excited about. Oh, somebody's raising their hand now. Okay, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A box. <laughs> if not, my email address is also on this screen. Oh, while you're thinking of your questions, we also run this program called Conservation at Home, which is basically I come over and do a site visit for you if you've got native plants and you're working on removing invasive species. Like it doesn't have to be done. You get a cool like little yard sign for your yard. Let's say you don't have anything, zero native plants. You're like, I don't have a single thing. I don't care. I'll still come do the site visit and um, do the consult and assist you in coming up with a plan. So the, the fee for that includes a membership to the Land Conservancy, which is pretty cool. And there's all kinds of counties in Illinois and other states too that do conservation at home as well. So if you're outside of McHenry County and you want to find where to do this, just email me and I can put you in contact um, with the proper group to do that. Okay, do we have any questions? We do. Okay, so um, Jackie in the chat asks, should I be concerned about plants spreading into my neighbor's property? How invasive are these native plants? Okay, so a little bit of terminology. Native plants cannot be considered invasive. Um, that term is reserved only for non-native plants, but they can be aggressive. <laughs> so here's the thing, Jackie, like I mean, yeah, native plants, they can spread into other people's yards, just like non-native plants can. You know, there's no difference. I mean, they produce a seed, just like any other plant, any non-native plant does that. Um, so what I've noticed in my yard is like, if these plants are spreading, like say into my lawn or something, like I'm just mowing them down. I don't really care. Like it's just getting mowed, so you don't really see it anyway. Um, so it's not a huge, I don't know. To me, it's not a huge deal. If though you're like, you know, have a garden bed and your neighbor has a garden bed right up against it, um, I would suggest maybe not planting tall, like eight foot tall, extremely aggressive plants. You know, some native plants are really aggressive, some of them are not at all. So it all just depends on which species you choose. Same thing with non-native plants, really, it's no different. So, good question. Awesome, okay, this is, um, let's see. Oh, it disappeared. Carol Jorgensen in uh, our, on our participant list has her hand raised. Um, so I'm gonna say allow to talk. Carol, if you are able to share your question, let's try it. Hi, Carol, you've got your hand raised. Are you able to chat with us? I, I had to unmute me. Got it. My question is, Sarah, I bought a prairie smoke plug at our spring sale. And 
I didn't know for what reason the drought or putting it in the wrong place or not keeping it watered at first enough, but it hasn't um, flourished. It's only put up two little or uh, three little or four little fuzzy things. So without the flower, I cannot collect the seeds. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And it's very normal for like, if you put a plug in, like a little baby plug in the first year, it's pretty normal for it not to flower. Um, a lot of the development goes into the roots the first year with native plants. And on top of that, yeah, this severe drought that we experienced all year as well, that was pretty hard on plants, especially newly planted things. So it's, it's normal. If there's any green to the leaves at all, like any green, chances are it's going to come back next oh, year. Yes. So I wouldn't give up on it. It stayed green. But Good. I don't yeah. have any flowers for seed is my question. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Probably next year you'll get flowers or potentially even the year after. Prairie smoke, I've had it take a couple years for them to actually make a flower. So that's it's worth the wait though. Out. My prairie coreopsis in the same location went crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are in, those are a species that um, will, even from seed, will germinate the first year. So they flower pretty profusely. And yeah, they spread pretty aggressively too. So, so that was a plug, but now I yep. should, should I gather its seeds when it's ready? Yeah, you can, and they should be ready soon because most of the prairie coreopsis blooms, I think, in like June or July. So they yeah. should be ready soon in, you know, October-ish, whenever. And those seed heads are really hard. Um, so I like to just kind of snip the entire thing off with some scissors and uh, just put it all in a paper bag. Good. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Thank you so much, nope. Carol. Oh. Yeah, any other questions? Let's see. Okay, so we've got quite a few. They just flew in. So here's one um, from, let's see, what is their name? Um, how successful are you at actually germinating plants? What can we expect? 10% germination less? No, I'd say more than that. So here's the thing with germination. It really depends on what kind of site preparation you did. And site preparation just means like, how did you just throw your seeds into a giant weed bed? Or did you throw seeds into like a really densely planted area? Or was it an area that was bare soil? So you're gonna get better germination with the less competition. I mean, that makes sense, right? So. I can tell you that like I have a whole section of my yard where I killed the lawn and um, seeded it with a whole native plant seed mix that I purchased from Prairie Moon Nursery there on the website on the resource list. And um, this is year six and I have pretty much seen every species in that mix has shown up. I've seen it. Even the really conservative high quality stuff like Baptisia and Shooting Star, I have seen those show up either last year or this year, now that I'm like six years into it. So, but I do, I don't let weeds make seeds in this area. You know, I do, so I do maintain it. Um, so you can get some, you can be really, really successful with seed. You just have to be patient with it. It's the biggest thing that I want people to realize. Good question though. Okay, next question is from Angela. And she said, is there a concern about damaging the seed structure? Ah, good question, Angela. So technically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there can be, especially on the bigger seeds. Um, so I don't know. I don't get that concerned about it because usually when you're, all right, usually I've got a large quantity of seed 
from different species. If you only have like two little, you know, seed heads of whatever it is, and it's really special to you, yes, be careful with that. But honestly, most of these seeds are pretty darn tough and it's going to be really hard to, to damage them. They're either really tough or they're really tiny. And the super tiny ones, like, that's going to be really difficult to physically rip the seed structure itself apart. Um, there are some, though, that you could damage them if you're being really aggressive with, like, the pliers. Um, I guess you could accidentally rip some of the seed structures apart. I don't know. I've never personally had a huge issue with it, but... I mean, it's, it's something that's worth thinking about as you are taking them apart. Good question. Awesome. Next question is from Caitlin, and she said, when would you say big blue stem seeds would be ready? Not yet. I would wait till, like, I would, okay, if you're here, if you're, like, you know, around the around where we are in the Chicago area, because it's going to differ by what latitude you're at. Um, I don't know, mid-October, I'd give it another, I'd give it like another week or two um, on the big blue stem. That one can be a little tricky. It depends, like, I've seen some where they're grazed, like in the middle of the summer, and then they like redevelop their seed structure. So that's going to take longer for that one to be ready. Whatever, generally mid, early to mid-October is fine with the big blue stem. Awesome, thank you. This question is from Dana and she said, could you review how to get seeds from blue labellia and cardinal flowers and when yeah. to sow their seeds? Yeah, okay, so the lobelias, Great blue lobelia cardinal flower. They grow in kind of usually wet areas. Um, so those are interesting because it's a stalk and they develop at different times. So the top of the stalk will like still have blooming petals on it, whereas the bottom, the seeds will be ripe sooner. So it kind of like progresses up the stalk. It's really interesting. So what I do with those, I don't try to just like take my hand and pull them off. I clip the whole thing and just put it into a paper bag. And then when it's all, when the entire stalk is like drown, dry and brown, that's what I'll do. I'll clip the whole thing off and put it into a paper bag and, and like rub it in my hands. And that, cause those seeds are so incredibly tiny and that dislodges it into the paper bag. Um, the lobelias, so cardinal flower, great blue lobelia, those are some that actually require the soil to be disturbed in order for those seeds to germinate. So, and this makes sense, right? If you think about it, like, okay, these seeds usually grow in wet areas where water, like, cuts through and makes disturbances, and it, like, just, it kind of churns up the soil a little bit. Those seeds love that, and that's when they're going to germinate and grow. So um, if you don't have that, like, happening naturally in your yard, you can mimic that soil disturbance when you disperse your seeds with, like, a rake or something. Just kind of scrape up the soil a little bit and then, like, throw the seeds into that little disturbed area. Um, these are, those are biennials those plants, those species. So that means the first year after they've grown from a seed, they're just going to be a group of leaves on the ground. It's called a basal rosette. They don't make a flower the first year. The second year, that little basal rosette is going to make the flower structure, okay? So just be patient with these biennials. Then the second year, that plant that has a flower on it, it's going to produce a bunch of seeds and that particular plant will not return the next year, all right? All of its little seeds are gonna return the next year. 
Good question. Okay, any okay. other questions? We have, we have, I think about four more. So you're in demand. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, close my door really quick because my kids sure. just got home. I'll be right back. No problem. Okay. <laughs> All right. This next question is from Caitlin. She says, what if you have a large stand of goldenrod? How can you diversify said area with seed or can you? All right, so if you're talking about Canada goldenrod, which I'm guessing you probably are, you put it in the chat or questions or whatever, Kate, tell us if you're talking about Canada goldenrod. Um, personally, I would not seed into like a monoculture stand of Canada goldenrod. It's like, if you look underneath that, it's usually the ground is just bare. It's just like solid Canada goldenrod in a lot of those areas. So what I would do, all right, so you gotta decide how much energy and time do you wanna put into this. There's a bunch of different ways you can control Canada goldenrod. It all depends on what you wanna do. You can hand pull it when the soil is moist, um, you can clip each stem, dab an herbicide on the stem. You can try to do a midsummer mow. So like in July, just like mow it all down. If you do that, um, or if you pull it out, what I suggest you do is get some warm season grasses growing in there. So I would seed like in the summer, I would seed into it um, like with some little blue stem seed or side oats grama. Those are both two good ones that can come up right away when they're sowed in the summer. Those are warm season grasses that grow actively when it's really, really warm out. Because what happens then it's basically bare soil with a bunch of Canada goldenrod stubble. Those grass seeds, when they're exposed to the sun, woohoo, they grow and they're going to help compete with the Canada goldenrod. I don't know. It is not a simple answer. I'm sorry about that, but it's something that we struggle with. I struggle with it in my own yard. We struggle with it in our restoration. Canada goldenrod is an extremely aggressive native plant that I don't let grow in my gardens. Definitely not. I have all kinds of other species of goldenrod <laughs> that I do let grow, but not Canada. Good question. Caitlin, Caitlin says, she's, she says, not an expert, but we believe it to be old field goldenrod, if that changes anything. Okay, well, old field's actually a good goldenrod to have. And so I would just let that kind of do its thing. Um, and you can seed other things into it if you want to, but I would just be really careful on your ID with that and um, really look into what Canada goldenrod is um, to try to get some a correct identification. My favorite identification app is called iNaturalist. It's free. It's really pretty decent, especially if you've got a flower structure to take a picture of. We really like that one a lot. So you could try that too. Awesome. This next question is from Julia. She says, I have a lot of birds in my backyard. So there is a danger everything sowed will be pecked up. Does it make sense to sow the seeds indoors and then take the seedlings outside? Okay, so yeah, that is a valid concern. This is the other reason I like to do it on top of the snow because the seed is usually dark in color. And when the sun shines on it, that seed just kind of slips down into the snow and then it's not eaten by birds. The other thing I'll do is so right on top of the snow, like an hour or two before it's going to snow. And then the freshly fallen snow covers the seed and it doesn't just get eaten by birds. Um, so, so those are just a couple little tricks. Yeah, you can do it indoors. You can sow indoors and transfer the little seedlings out. Just know that all the different species have all different germination requirements. Um, and honestly, that's why I've never really gotten into it because I don't have time to like 
stratify these in sand that's moist for this amount of time and that's how it's going to break germination like i don't have time for that now a lot of people do and that's awesome because that is a good way to ensure success so um to learn the germination requirements for each different kind of plant go to prairie moon nursery's website so prairiemoon.com and they're going to have a little germination code with each species and it's going to tell you what that plant needs in order to break dormancy this is why i think it's just easier to throw them out and let nature take care of it um, but you can simulate that and make that happen as well Thank you. And all right, this question is from Rita, and she asks, can Baptisia australis seeds be saved, or do they have to be direct sowed right away? No, you can save those. The thing with Baptisia is open up the pod and look and see if there's little weevils inside. <laughs> those are just these little, little tiny bugs that eat the seeds. And, and Baptisia pods are notorious for just having tons of weevils inside them and then it's like pointless for you to be holding on to the pods when there's like a million weevils that are just eating all the seed. So once the seeds are ready, like once the pods are dry and crumbly, you know, they're really going to be brown. Like those pods are giant. Um, just pop it open and check for weevils in there before you go to the effort of like saving all these pods. And then you won't have weevils crawling over your house either. That is very good information. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, this is the last question I see in the chat. This is from Marlene and she asks, I collected seeds from Prairie Smoke. I have them in a paper bag. Should I go out and spread them in the area I want? Also, what about Blazing Star? Should I spread around now in my garden? Okay, so the prairie smoke, yeah, just throw it out now. Um, is it going to be viable? Probably not. <laughs> That's a notoriously hard plant to get to grow from seed, especially when the seed is older like this. That's why we recommend direct sowing it, like literally taking the seeds and just kind of like pushing it into the soil right away, like in June after you've collected it. But really, what's it going to hurt for you to put it out there now? Nothing. Um, blazing star. So it depends. The blazing stars are going to be some when they're, they're ready, when they're white and fluffy. So I know I still have some blazing star that's like weirdly still blooming. I don't know what's going on with that. So that's definitely not ready to collect yet. But there are some in some areas that are ready. So whatever. When they're white and fluffy, yes, you can get your blazing star seed. If you want to hold on to those, you can hold on to those. Um, so guys, the rule of thumb with the can I hold on to it? Do I direct sow it? Basically, if you've collected it from July through October, um, you can hold on to it. The exceptions are, is it a droop? So like a berry. Is it one of those? Then no. Or is it a ballistic seed? Then no. So if you've collected it from July to October, go ahead, keep it in some bags and spread it over the winter. Okay. I mean, all right. Rule of thumb is spread seed anytime between October and February. So it's basically the seed. I don't know. I like to wait and do it in like January or something on top of the snow. So that's what I like to do. Okay. Any other Wonderful. questions? That, that was all the questions. So this is your last chance if you have a burning question to <laughs> share with us. Um, oh, we have, okay, we have one more hand up. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is Carol Jorgensen again. Let's see here. Uh, there we go. Have to ask to unmute. And oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, take you a second here. <laughs> I'm sorry, Carol. Um, I'm having and, trouble. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what is the relationship of my false indigo 
that I bought at the at the local nursery when it went half price to the indigo that our native indigo. Okay, so blue false indigo um, is Baptisia australis. That is going to be native, and I'm literally looking this up right now because I couldn't remember, because <laughs> I always forget this one, but um, let me do, so false indigo native range. I know it's native like further south. It's not necessarily native right up here. So I'm going to blue false indigo. Oh, Prairie Moon Nursery. They have the range, native range maps for all these plants. It's really cool. Um, so that's going to be native further southwest. I don't even know, like Missouri and Texas and whatever, all down there. Um, technically not native up here in Northern Illinois, whatever. It still grows up here, not a huge deal. There are other varieties of Baptisia that are native in Northern Illinois. Um, Baptisia alba, Baptisia leucophia, whatever. There's probably some other ones too. Okay, so that's, that's the difference. It's just different species. Um, lots of people successfully grow the blue false indigo up here. What, what concerns me when I buy from the nursery that is that I might be buying a cultivar. You might. And the way you know if it's a cultivar or not is on the tag. If it says like some weird name after the species name in quotes. So if it's like Baptisia australis quote, crimson sunrise. Like, I don't know, I'm totally making that up. But like, that's how you know it's a cultivar when it's got this descriptive name in quotes after the species name usually, then you know it is not a straight, it's not a straight species plant. Or in front, I, my uh, academia yeah. has a name in front of it. Yeah, so just some weird name that you're like, you are not, like a Latin name. <laughs> so right. Latin names are going to usually consist of like a species and a genus. So right. Baptisia is the species, Australis is the genus. So anything outside of that is usually going to be some weird cultivar. Well, mine does. Mine, mine is good. <laughs> I got lucky on that one. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Um, we have a question here from Tom. I'm going to press allow to talk. Here we go. Oh, just kidding. He didn't mean to press the button. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Um, okay, let's see here. I think that might actually be it. I think we've, we've gotten all our questions. We just have a lot of thank yous to you, Sarah, in the chat. Um, everybody is saying how much they enjoyed the presentation, how helpful it was, excellent. Um, so thank you all for sharing that because Sarah deserves all the accolades. Oh goodness, thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I appreciate you taking your evening to listen to me talk about plants. <laughs> If you have any questions, go ahead and reach out. And your libraries are great resources for all kinds of books, right, Katie? Yes, yes, yes. We love to help with this. And we, you know, if you have trouble contacting Sarah, you want to email her, but um, you have maybe trouble getting into your email, we are happy to help with that too from the library as well. So whatever you need, let us know. Perfect. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having me tonight. And with that, I'm going to let you guys go and everybody have a good night. Wonderful. Thank you. Everybody watch your emails. We recorded this, so we're going to email you a link as soon as we can so you can rewatch it or um, share with your friends, family. And thank you again, Sarah. Hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Great. Thanks. Bye.